Okay. So I'll start with a little bit of show and share about uh, proteins and why they're the greatest thing on Earth. This is not working. Yeah, guess why it's not working? So the protein loses its charge. So it starts coming together via hydrophobic interactions and forming a 3D network, a gel, entrapping the moisture. So there is no loss of moisture. There might be a little bit loss of moisture due to the heat, the 37 to 40 degrees heat. But essentially, what changes the structure from liquid to solid is food. So the protein forms a gel. Okay. All right. So another three ounce milk and three ounce cheese. Which one has more water? Milk. Yeah. Are you sure? What do you think? No, Are you sure? <laughs> okay. Right. So <laughs> in this case, what happens? It's a different formation of a gel. So in cheese making, what happens is you use rennet enzymes. Sometimes you can use culture as well, but rennet enzyme is very important. And when we talk about daily protein, we learn how rennet enzyme breaks a certain type of casein, chops up kappa casein specifically, and then the chopping up of kappa casein results in so many different interactions happening. The uh, calcium bridges between the casein and also hydrophobic interaction and then the protein comes together not to form a 3D gel, but to form a coagulum. So the coagulum is that protein comes and fuses together, and, they, and then they expel the water. And then you have the curd, and then you have the whey, in this case. So that's why cheese has lower moisture content than yogurt or milk. Because in this case, the gel is a coagulum, not the three-dimensional gel that holds water. Alright. Cool. Okay, so I prepared the dough yesterday and now it melted. I was going to take it out. But you've all handled dough before, right? So the dough basically you can squish it into a bowl, you can extend it, squish it again. So what property is that? What do we call usually this this kind of property? The Huh? The Biology, but specifically viscoelastic property. So the dough has a viscoelastic property. Okay. So what I did with half of my dough this morning is I took half of the dough and I like playing with the dough. So what I did is I washed the dough under water. So I washed all the starch out and look what, what remained. Have you ever seen a gluten protein? So that's your gluten. Look, it has a very fine gluten, too. It's not broken. Great. I did a good job. 
I have a master's in filmmaking. I'm not kidding. My master's was in film control. Okay, so basically the, the gluten network within that dough is what's giving your extensibility and elasticity. So the dough extends and then go back to its original form. Can go back to its original form. Depending on the types of proteins within the gluten network, you may have more extensibility and less elasticity, or more elasticity and less extensibility. Depending on the type of wheat that you have, you will get those different viscoelastic properties. So for a bread that requires rising, like a loaf bread, this is not very well right risen bread, but so this is a loaf bread. So basically that it rises during fermentation and baking, so you have this uh, structure with the cells here. What holds the structure together is your viscoelastic uh, protein network. So elasticity in this case is really important to hold and not break, and gives the bread some form of resistance. Okay. But a different type of bread needs a different type of flour that extends more than is elastic. Have you ever had a pita bread? So in pita bread making, you really don't, there's no rising here. There is extension. So you form the dough, and then you roll it to form that round shape. And you don't want it to get smooshed back. You want it to remain flat. So basically, and then when you bake it, it doesn't really rise anymore. It remains thin layers. What makes it a pocket, basically, is the evaporation of moisture. And then you have the vapor and the, and the CO2 gas as well that will expand it open, but not really holding any volume, okay? So in this type of bread, for this type of bread, you need a different type of wheat that perhaps has higher gliding to dependent ratio. You will learn when we talk about cereal proteins, we will learn that glidins are more extensible and glutenin are more elastic. So a flour with higher gliding to glutenin ratio would be better for pita bread, and a flour with lower gliding to ratio will be better for loaf bread. Okay, so, okay, what's the main protein in cake? Okay, you do have some flour there, but here you really don't want extensibility or elasticity. See, it breaks, you don't, you don't have any resistance. What, what do you need? In a, in a cake batter. What functionality do you really need in a cake batter? Huh? Emulsion. Emulsion and? Moisture. Yeah, you don't want water holding, but you want something very important, foam as well. So you need foam and you need emulsion. Yeah, you do need water holding too. But here, the gluten protein that is not what you really, what giving you that texture to the egg proteins, but giving you the texture that you want in your cake. So different proteins gives you different textures. Okay, so I have a jello here. Do you like jello? I don't. <laughs> okay. So very solid, nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna take it. Hopefully it shouldn't flip. <coughs> it shouldn't flip. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it didn't flip. All right, what do you think the concentration of protein in there? So you have water, protein, sugar. 2%. Huh? 2%. 2%. Any other takers? 1%. 1%. We're going down. I'm not sure. <laughs> I was hoping that you'd go up, but yes, down. This is 1%. So this gives you the power of protein. 1% of protein can form a gel, but not any 1% of protein. Gelatin would form a gel with 1% protein. Different proteins, like soy protein, requires 10% at least to form a gel. Okay? So the type of protein is important for the formation of the gel in terms of concentration. The lower the concentration, the better, obviously. You would use less protein and get the texture that you want. So this is a great gelling protein. So you have the gelatin in there, 
You have the egg, you have the wheat, you have the casein. High protein beverage. What protein do you think is here in this? You need a soluble protein. This is an acidic beverage for athletes. You, really, you want them to be soluble and clear. You can't see it, but it's really clear, green, greenish um, product. Oh, you can see it from here. It's clear. And it has quite a bit of protein. Um, I would say 8% protein. Wow, that's pretty high. Oh, no, it has 8 grams, nine. It has 8 grams in 240 milliliters. So about 4% protein. 3%. Not a lot, but still. 3% uh, of casein protein will not be clear, and it might precipitate. Same with egg protein, for example. Or gluten, you we cannot. Gluten forming protein will not form a soluble, clear beverage. So, what's in there is whey protein. Whey protein is known to be the golden standard for beverages because it's soluble under acidic pH. So as you can see, I think the demonstration is telling you that every protein has a unique functionality. There is not one magical protein that will be suited for all applications. Every protein has a different structure and different function and different application. But we can, we learn later on in the class, once we learn about structure and function, we can change structure to target a certain function. But we can't make cheese from gluten. <coughs> we haven't reached to that yet. Who knows? OK, so basically, here is a kind of a summary table of a functional property of a protein and an application. So solubility, such as the example of whey protein, so beverages and shakes. Water holding capacity is the ability to hold water in a three-dimensional matrix. So uh, in this case, meat and poultry products, cheese, yogurt, surimi is a, cheese, uh, is a fish product. Gelation, meat and poultry product like sausages. So you want to form a gel and hold water. Um, custard, yogurt, tofu, for example, is made of soy. So soy protein can be formed into a gel under certain processing in the presence of calcium, for example. Then you can form a gel, form tofu, which mimics a meat product. Emulsification. Mayonnaise, it's an emulsi emulsion. Uh, frozen dessert, ice cream, it's an emulsion, and it's a foam as well, because you're forming, uh, you're trapping air, and as well, you're mixing fat and aqueous. Foaming uh, the whipped topping, meringues, angel cakes, etc., are all examples of foam uh, products. Okay, just knowledge check. You will learn all of this in this class, so just to see what background you come with. Oh, Katie's ready. All of the above. Yeah, yeah, all of the above. Summed it all for us. What's denaturation? When we say protein denaturation, what do we mean by that? I know you know. <laughs> secondary? Um, you, you, the secondary structure and denaturation can happen at multiple levels. So you can denature the protein by unfolding of the tertiary structure or changing of the native form of the structure. And oftentimes it's unfolding. So if you have a globular tertiary structure, Unfolding is a denaturation at the tertiary level. But you can also have denaturation at the secondary level, where sometimes alpha uh, structures, alpha helixes, convert to beta sheets. Sometimes alpha helixes and beta sheets converts to random coil. We're going to learn about these different structures. 
we can have denaturation occurring at the primary stage of structure or the primary structure. So we have primary, secondary, and tertiary. What's the primary? The peptide bonds. Okay, so primary are the peptide bonds. So you can hydrolyze, break the peptide bonds. That's also a form of denaturation. So we have denaturation at different levels. So obviously, any change in structure, whether unfolding, whether changing in the secondary to tertiary, secondary structure, you'll see in different applications, that is a form of denaturation that would impact certain functionality. What is an R group on the amino acid? What's the R group? What's the amino acid made up of? Huh? There is a carbon chain. Part of the R group is a carbon chain. So let me show you. So this is your famous amino acid structure, right? So you have an amine group, you have a carboxyl group, you have the carbon in the middle. Sometimes it's most often chiral carbon. That means each bond is bonded to a different group. And then you have the H here and the R. So the R here can be a hydrocarbon chain or can be a hydrocarbon chain with an amine group with a sulfidyl group, with a hydroxyl group, with the ring structure. So it can, it can carry multiple different functional groups. And these functional groups can partake in interactions, in molecular interactions, either within the protein itself or within another, with other protein in the system or with other constituents in the system, like with a sugar or with a fat or with water. So the I group is the most important. Obviously, amine and carboxyl groups are important because they are ionizable group. But the R, but all amino acids have a carboxyl and amine group. So what differentiates each amino acid is the R group. What differentiate proteins are the R groups within the amino acids in that protein. Number of thiols. So thiol, you can hear the word thiol or um, uh, sulfhydryl group or SH group. All mean the same thing. SH is a thiol group or a sulfhydryl group. Same thing. For example, a cysteine or cysteine is an amino acid that has a free sulfhydryl group. And the presence of free sulfhydryl group, that means it's prone to oxidation with another cysteine with a free sulfhydryl group to form a disulfide bond. Formation of disulfide bond is important for the stabilization of the protein structure itself, like a protein, one protein with a lot of disulfhydryl uh, bonding. That means it's a really stable tertiary structure with a high denaturation temperature. That means it requires high temperature to unfold that protein. Presence of disulfide bond can be important for formation of polymers. And we'll talk a lot about that later on in different applications. So yes to all of the above, denaturation, R group, free thiol groups. Definitely we'll talk more about each um, in more detail. What about this one? A and B. Let's see, other takers. H. Becky? None of Thank you. It's none of the above. It is none of the above. The first one might be tempting. You go both emulsification and foaming relies on surface properties. Although they're very similar in, in their, how they function, the emulsifier interacts, the protein interacts with aqueous and interacts with the oil, non-polar non side, and, and, then, and a foaming agent interacts part ways with the air and part ways with the aqueous, but the interaction is not necessarily identical. So 
there could be a protein that can foam and emulsify good, but not necessarily every protein that emulsify or is a good emulsifier is also a good, good foaming agent. It's more complex than just that. And forming a gel requires different mechanism than forming an emulsion. So a protein that forms a strong gel, like gelatin, for example, is not a good emulsifier. It really forms a good gel at 1% protein, but it's not an emulsifier by nature. So the mechanism of forming gel is different than the mechanism of forming an emulsion, and we'll talk about that in more detail. Um, a protein with low surface hydrophobicity is a good emulsifier? No. You require high surface hydrophobicity to emulsify, or a relatively high surface hydrophobicity to emulsify. If surface hydrophobicity is low, that means you have more interaction with water and much less interaction with your lipid components. So you want some sort of a balance between hydrophobic and hydrophilic on the surface because you want that protein to have kind of a dual function in order to emulsify. All right. So what's the role of, of proteins? First thing comes to mind is bodybuilding. You know, eat protein, you get muscles. That's what I have under what I'm wearing today. I love protein, therefore I have muscles. I don't exercise that well, so no. But first function, obviously high protein, rich, uh, products basically for athletes to help them with their building of their muscles as they exercise. So that's one great role. But mostly it's needed as a nutritional supplement, obviously. So it has a nutritional contribution, which is a function of protein quality and quantity. So we need a requirement per day, 50 grams requirement per day for our body function. So it is a requirement. We need a certain amount, but not any amount of protein or any type of protein. 50 grams of any protein does not suffice the 50 grams needed. So you need essential amino acids, okay? Can you list some essential amino acids? Histidine. 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 Okay, histidine, isoleucine. Lysa, only Rachel is going to list them. What? Cysteine. Cysteine is, is not always essential. You can make cysteine from methionine. No. Phenylalanine, valine, arginine is uh, sometimes for children, right? Um, what didn't we mention? Tyrosine. Tyrosine? Tyrosine? Tyrosine can be made from another, from phenylalanine. Sometimes it's essential. Methionine, lysine, histidine, leucine, isoleucine, thionine, right? Tryptophan. Okay, I think we listed them. I'm not gonna, uh, there is no question in the test on essential amino acids, but I thought you should know them. Okay, um, so we need those essential because body does not produce them, and um, what makes the protein of a good quality is not only the presence of essential amino acid, there's also the digestibility of the protein is very important. So even if you're consuming 50 grams of protein per day, depending on the source of that protein, it might not all be digestible. It not, might not be all 100% digestible. So animal protein are more easily digestible than plant protein. 
slightly denatured protein is more digestible than native structured protein. So in order for us to benefit from the protein, it has to be digested so we can absorb those amino acids and peptides and benefit from that. So there is what we call uh, protein digestibility amino acid corrected score, amino acid score. Protein digestibility corrected amino acid score. Okay, so what this takes into account, the digestibility of the protein and the limiting amino acid. That means the essential amino acid present in the lowest amount. So a PDK of one obviously is the best. So it's 100% digestible, contains all essential amino acid in the minimum amount required. So the value that you obtain here, the percent daily value, in order to obtain it, you have to multiply the quantity of the protein by its PDK. So let's say the protein that you're consuming is What's 80% of 50? Is it 40? Okay. So if, if, if you have a PDCAS of 0.8 and you're consuming 50 grams of that, that means only 40 grams of this protein is bioavailable. So 40 grams out of 50 gives you 80% of the daily value. So obviously different proteins from different sources have different PDCAS values. And PDCAS values, keep in mind, which is really a common thing that people do not know, PDCAS is impacted by processing. So there is no fixed PDCAS for a protein depending on its source. How was that protein processed? Because it might have been processed in a way that enhanced digestibility or it might have been processed in a way that decreases digestibility. So PDCAS is not a fixed number for any application. Questions? You can ask questions, you know. Give and circle too, if you want. Okay. I will, should I give you five minutes break? Yeah? Go ahead. You can have five minutes break. Where would other meat fall under the dish? Other meat? Yeah. So here we have beef, right? Uh, usually meat has really high feed cats, so it's always between 0.9 and 1. Yeah. So PDCAS doesn't include what the amino acid profile is in that food either? No, it includes, uh, so PDCAS takes into account the least um, pre essential amino acid present. So or the essential amino acid that is present in the least amount. So let's say in wheat, lysine is the limiting amino acid. It's present in the least amount. So it takes that into consideration. So usually, let's say, there is a minimum requirement for the body for each amino, each essential amino acid. And if, if that particular amino acid meet, meets 80% of that requirement, so it will have an amino acid score of 0.8. And then if the digestibility is 100%, then the PDCAS score is 0.8. <laughs> Rachel, did you take Lisa and Jason? Yeah, I just marked them. Okay. I've got this piece. Oh, you've got this. You have practiced. I was telling Lucy that it's always funny to me when people realize how long I've been in school mm -hmm. and then they say, I'm just practicing to perfect being a student. Well, there you go. We are always students, even after we graduate. That's the best part. I'm going to be a professional at it by the time I graduate. There you go. So, Becky, are you a graduate of our program? Yep. An yeah, so I'm the 
weird students are doing the working full time part time school. Yeah. She did do her program. Yeah, I did do her I missed having you in my class. Yeah, because when I went through the class in Utah, I was thinking to get here because I think you were on sabbatical. Oh, yeah. I was like, I'm just here. Yeah. So. Lucky you. Our class joked that, like, we were very students when we graduated because we took so many with them. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Processing and yeah. engineering and analysis. Did you and capstone, you? probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you teach other? You did chem reactions, right? So originally, I started the chem reaction. I developed the class, but Kati took it from the beginning. I just gave a few lectures here and there. That's all. Yeah. So. Yeah. How do they decide like semi-essential amino acid? And history is probably a semi-essential. Yeah. Like, how do they? It, it depends, I think, on age and requirement of your, yeah, yeah. And then there are other that are semi-essential that can be produced from other amino acids. So, um, like cysteine can be produced from methionine. Tyrosine can be produced from phenylalanine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, corn has a lysine limiting, yeah. Okay. Now back to this. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Like, can you explain the percent daily value of R again? Percent daily value. Okay, maybe if I write down uh, this What? There is no nothing to write with in this classroom. Oh. So daily requirement is is fifty grams per day, right? So if you're consuming fifty grams from X protein. Yeah, X protein. But this X protein has PDCAS of 0.8. Right? So that means the actual protein that if you are able to absorb and benefit from is 40 grams. Okay. So the requirement is 50. So 40 grams out of 50 is 80% daily value. So you are actually consuming 80% of the daily quantity. Yeah. Okay. 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 So, protein demand. So other than being good for muscle building and needed for nutritional requirement, people have been wanting more protein in their diet. And the demand is, is about 202 million tons of proteins for the 7.3 billion individuals on this planet. So why do you think the demand is on the rise? Huh? Sustainability. So like we're using more resources that we don't have, so we're trying to be more sustainable. Sustainability. Um, actually, sustainability reason is driving people to have more plant protein. 
yes. versus animal protein. Here we're talking about all, oh. all protein. Okay. Huh. Um, making up for lax in diet with the keto diet to replace your those carbs. <coughs> so getting more protein in the diet to replace carbs, so more healthy diet. Mm -hmm. Like rising Yes, food. yes, rising income, definitely. Especially in developing countries, they're consuming more animal proteins than they used to in the past. Okay, so we said health, we said income. Let's see, what do I have here? Okay, well, anyway, the population is growing. Estimation 9 billion, from 7 billion to 9 billion by 2050. So obviously, we're going to need more protein. Socioeconomic changes, so rising in income, increased urbanization, aging population, since protein has been associated with healthy aging. So for elderly, consuming protein is, is good. So recognizing protein's role in a healthy diet, replacing high carb with, by protein. So far, there hasn't been a study that shows that proteins are bad for you. Um, maybe high consumption of protein might end, might end up being bad for you, but compared to high carb diet or high fat diet, high protein diet is is more appealing. Eating more animal protein in developing countries and increases in alternative protein demand is in developed countries, like countries like in the US, they're asking for alternative protein. This is for sustainability reasons, but definitely everybody's seeking proteins, whether it's an alternative source of protein, or animal protein, or just protein. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you said that you wanted to know the of protein. Do we have it? Like, do we have it? I mean, well, I think so, because this number is based maybe on, not just on what people are demanding, but what they are getting. What they're getting. Yeah, as of 2017. But maybe with the population growth, they're estimating that if we continue the way we are, we might not be able to have the amount of protein that we need for that population. Because we, are, we have diminishing lands and we are um, producing green green gas um, greenhouse gases and all of that so that's why we're going into the sustainability route and looking for alternative proteins okay so so going to the focusing on the health uh, benefits recognizing proteins as as healthy uh, diet so there is the claim by FDA in 1999, for example, that 25 grams of soy protein a day as part of a diet low in saturated fat and cholesterol may reduce the risk of heart disease. This goes under physiological function that is beyond nutrition, that is beyond the 50 grams requirement per day. Okay, So that is what other health contribution protein is giving us. So this claim um, came in 1999 after several studies that showed long-term effect to prove that this much of soy protein a day will actually is correlated with reduced risk of heart disease. Now, have you heard that, I think in 2018, early 2018, the FDA wanted to revoke this claim. Did you hear about it? Lucy heard about it. So there has been a talk by FDA that recent studies after 1999 showed contradictory findings. So they wanted to revoke this, but they got a lot of complaints um, against that, that revoking of this claim. DuPont is one of the companies that actually uh, criticized FDA by wanting to revoke a claim based on studies that did not necessarily look at 25 grams consumption. Some studies that had uh, no association with heart disease did not use 25 grams, they used less than that. And this is a, an amount dependent finding. 
So I don't think at this point it's been revoked. It's still under consideration due to a lot of complaints that, it, no, it's still valid. And FDA needs to look closely into evidence before revoking a claim. So anyway, that is one claim. And that's after this claim, everybody wanted to put soy protein in their, in their products. It's, it became like soy protein is king. Um, so it was incorporated in a lot of different products. About 5,000 different products have soy protein in them. Um, so here's an example in chocolate temptation bar. It has soy protein blend, um, having soy protein isolate, for example, uh, and a soy protein concentrate in it as part of the main ingredients. Bioactive peptides. So these are peptides that come obviously from proteins. So either you produce them outside of the body by producing hydrolysate. You, you digest the protein and then produce a, a product that is a hydrolysate and then incorporate that in a food application. Or when we ingest proteins, our digestive enzyme chop up these proteins and can also produce bioactive peptides. But this process is more random. It's not targeted by when we produce the hydrolysates ourselves. But in any case, bioactive peptides, which are sequences within the protein, if they are chopped at the right places and released, they will have a specific functionality, specific physiological functionality. Some of them reduce hypertension. Uh, others are antidepressants. Some promote satiety. Some are anti-inflammatory, antioxidant activity. So another physiological uh, benefit for proteins. Some proteins uh, can associate very well with phytochemicals, with bioactive components, such as isoflavones. These are phytochemicals present in soy. They have this ring structure, which makes them liking more hydrophobic than hydrophilic regions. So they would go in and associate with the interior moiety of the protein, which happens to be hydrophobic in nature. So they would interact with the protein, sometimes via really strong interactions, and they are carried with the protein. So a protein isolate or a soy protein isolate is high in isoflavones. And there has been research to show that isoflavones have several um, physiological functions. Other than health and nutrition, proteins in foods have physical functional properties. So they are used as ingredients, or they are naturally in an ingredient for a particular product because they have certain contribution to physical properties. Color is one. So the white color of cheese, for example, well, in this case, it's yellow, but the cheese curd is white. So the cheese curd whiteness comes from casein. The casein in my cell is light scattering, so it scatters light, so it gives you the white color. Some proteins are chromophores. That means they absorb light. So like myoglobin and vitellins, myoglobin in meat and vitellins in red, they absorb the colors and project the red color that we see. Browning, which is desirable in some cases. So we have two types of browning, the non-enzymatic browning, which is Maillard reaction and the enzymatic browning, which is contributed by the one and only, let the ones that needs participation point. <laughs> You've done that for the analysis, you remember? Yeah. <laughs> Did you want to say that? Polyphenol oxidase. OK. So here's your cheese curds. Here's an example of a desired Maillard reaction, which is in the bread. So when we bake the bread, we have this brown crust. And this is due to Maillard reaction. So this is desirable. 
And enzymatic due to the polyphenol oxidase. So here's your apple. So cut an apple and leave it. It will brown except for Granny Smith. Why? Granny Smith lasts for a long time before it brown. It becomes brown. Huh? I mean, you're right on that the acid inhibits uh, this, but Granny Smith is genetically modified to reduce the amount of polyphenol oxidase in it. So, yeah. But it is desired in tea, for example. So polyphenol oxidase reaction in tea is desirable because you want that color. Flavor. Oh boy, proteins play a big role in flavor, don't they? They themselves can contribute to flavor or they can interact with flavor compounds. Right. But they themselves can contribute to flavor, how so? So protein as such is not necessarily, does not have a distinct flavor or taste, but certain amino acids and high concentration of certain amino acids can result in a particular note. So hydrophobic amino acids are associated with bitter taste. So if you have, um, let's say, a hydrolysate and you break it off and you release a lot of hydrophobic peptides, then you get that bitter note, you get that bitter taste. If you have a high concentration of acidic amino acid, then you get that sour taste. If you have high concentration of cysteine, like in eggs, you get the sulfur taste. You get, yeah, that note, this, this very characteristic sulfur note from egg fruit. Um, monosodium glutamate, it's not necessarily a protein. It is, um, it's a glutamic acid that interacts with the sodium to give you monosodium glutamate, which has a very distinctive taste, which is the umami taste. Proteolysis. So proteolysis not only can result in hydrophobic uh, peptides that can be bitter, but proteolysis during cheese ripening, for example, is very characteristic for the, the flavor of a ripened cheese. So proteolysis and lipolysis together, they give you a very unique taste of a ripened cheese. So lipid hydrolysis as well as protein hydrolysis during ripening. Sweetness, which is not due to a protein itself, it's due to a dipeptide, which, uh, which is basically a peptide between uh, aspartic acid and phenylalanine, which gives you the aspartame, which has a very sweet taste. So in one way or another, um, proteins can contribute to color and to flavor. Proteins obviously contribute to the texture of the food. So they are added for, to obtain certain texture. So we need the water binding. We need uh, the solubility, like in a beverage. To incorporate high protein, you need the protein to be soluble. Gelation, coagulation. So the gelation as in the formation of a jelly or a formation of a tofu, for example. Uh, emulsification and foaming. Like ice cream is an emulsion and a foam. Um, sponge cake is a foam as well as an emulsion. Viscosity in certain sauces. Viscoelasticity for bread. So, so many different food applications that require a particular texture, and this texture is formed due to interactions. So interactions either with another protein, so protein water interaction gives you a gel, okay? Or interaction with lipids and water, such as um, an emulsion, or interaction with a carbohydrate in water, all of these interactions can be through different bonding, ionic, hydrogen bonding, hydrophobic, or covalent bonding, 
and also covalent cross-linking if we have disulfide linkages or Maillard reaction, for example, as well can cause Maillard reaction is a linking between a protein and a carbohydrate. And it's a covalent reaction. There are other forms of covalent reactions. We'll talk about them in different applications as well. So these interactions gives you a certain structure, and that structure is characteristic for a certain food product. So now we see that protein has a role in color, in flavor, and in texture, as well as nutrition and physiology uh, as well, physiological benefits as well. But there is a downside to every positive story. So there are some anti-nutritional factors and toxic components. So anti-nutritional factors can be proteins as well, such as enzyme inhibitors. So you might end up with a protease inhibitor, such as trypsin inhibitor. So trypsin is one of our digestive uh, proteases in our gut that digest proteins. So in soy, for example, you have naturally occurring trypsin inhibitor. If we consume an, a, a bunch of raw soy beans, we'll end up with accumulation of trypsin inhibitor, and then we will end up with a problem with digesting our proteins due to the inhibitor inhibiting the trypsin in our body. That's why when we consume or when they produce soy or soy products, they make sure that the trypsin inhibitor is 90% inactivated. So they are heat treated to ensure that trypsin inhibitor has been 90% inactive by processing. So it's kind of a processing requirement. Same with uh, amylase inhibitor, which is naturally present in cereal. We also have amylase in our digestive system that would digest starch. So again, an inhibitor that would inhibit that enzyme that is necessary to digest starch will impair the digestion of our carbohydrate. <coughs> so both of these obviously are proteins. Protease inhibitor and amylase inhibitor are proteins. Another downside to a protein is the allergenicity. A certain percentage of the population develops allergies to proteins. And there are the big eight. They're called the big eight because these are eight proteins that are found by the FDA to cause more than 90% of the, out the allergenicity uh, reported, or the food allergenicity Report. So that's why they're called the big eight. Among the big eight, um, the milk proteins, casein and whey protein, soybean proteins, glycinin and conglycinin, wheat proteins or gluten forming proteins, peanut proteins, egg proteins. So these are among the big eight. Other, uh, the other three are tree nuts, shellfish, and fish. Are the other three? big allergens. So labeling, food labeling requires that you put on the label whether or not it contains any of the allergens. Contains wheat, gluten, and soya, for example, here in the label. More than the highest recall, percentage of recall, in the last few years came from recalls of allergens that are not reported on the label. So even if it's processed in a plant that process allergens, you have to put that on the label. M&M, oftentimes, you'll see on the label, processed with, in a plant with peanuts. So they have, they have to put that on the, on the label. So allergenicity of proteins is one of the reasons also people are looking for alternative sources of proteins that are currently not among the big eight. So that's where people are more interested in pea protein, for instance, or any source of an alternative protein that did not make it yet to the big eight. But soon they will. And that's what they don't want to know and they don't want to tell you. Because 50 years ago, there was no soy protein allergy. 
it wasn't among any big eight. Because 50 years ago, soy was mostly consumed or used for oil production or naturally in other natural products of soy. But now you have soy protein in so many different products, not necessarily natural products of soy. So people being exposed to soy, anybody with allergenicity or prone to develop allergenicity, they are going to do that upon exposure. So it will happen. Pea protein might be part of the big nine pretty soon. It's coming. Um, toxic components. So some amino acid can be precursors of toxins. You all, all know that cured meat, because of no, using nitrates, you, nitrates can interact with proteins to give nitrosal amine products. And these are carcinogens. Also, you, some of you might have heard of heterocyclic amines. Have you heard of those? No, that's OK. These, when you cook the meat, oh, especially when you uh, not uh, cook it, what, uh, what do you call that, roast it? Grill it, yeah. When you grill the meat and they kind of burn your meat, you form these heterocyclic amines due mostly to the male reaction, so interaction with um, creatine uh, protein. So it's a, um, a, by, a byproduct or an intermediate product of the male reaction. Um, lectins, these are mostly pre uh, present in seeds. So if you eat a lot of raw seeds, <coughs> you might consume an appreciable amount of lectins, and these proteins can cause kind of an inflammation in the intestine and some sort of a um, hemorrhage. So basically, better to eat cooked seeds than raw. Others evident in eggs, these can, this protein can bind to biotin, which is a vitamin, one of the B vitamins, and then render it biologically unavailable. Histamine, which, is, which comes from histidine, so it's a decarboxylation of histidine, gives you histamine, and it can be found in fish products, and it's obviously a vasoactive amine, causing constriction of them. Okay. Would roasting a seed be enough to be into lectin or activate the... Would roasting? Roasting, or would it be more like vigorous? Well, roasting, I thought, is vigorous, isn't it? There's a direct contact with heat mm -hmm. for a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just didn't know if there was one versus another was better for. I'm not. I, I'm not quite sure what would be the best combination of temperature and time, but definitely cooked, roasted, anything is better than raw. Okay. All right. The bulk of this course will be looking at the protein structure and function interaction and how does that impact a product. So we'll be looking, we'll be studying protein structure in um, a little bit in detail, but mostly towards how would that affect protein function. So with protein structure, we'll be looking at intrinsic factors. So factors that impact the protein structure in its native form. So among these intrinsic factors, huh, need batteries. Among the intrinsic factors, so we have the protein source. So is the protein coming from milk, from soy, from uh, meat, from egg? Where is that source of protein? Based on the source, you get different composition, amino acid composition. And not only amino acid composition, amino acid sequence. So which amino acid com comes after what in a sequence of amino acid in a polypeptide? How many ionizable and reactive groups do we have? So the R group of your amino acid, how many of those have functional groups that will have interactions within the protein? and across different proteins and with other constituents. The hydrophobicity, total hydrophobicity of the protein, if you have a protein that is over 40% hydrophobic, that means it's a very insoluble protein. 
So the total hydrophobicity impacts solubility, impacts functionality. Now, another one is surface hydrophobicity, the distribution of the hydrophobic groups on the surface of the protein versus on the inside of the protein. For example, whey protein is very hydrophilic on the surface. So it's a not good natural emulsifier. But it's a very soluble protein because it has a low surface hydrophobicity on the surface. Hmm? However, soy protein is has high surface hydrophobicity, so it can emulsify um, better than whey protein. Casein protein is a natural emulsifier. Why? Because it's an open structure protein with a lot of hydrophobic residues on the surface of the protein. So surface hydrophobicity and total hydrophobicity. Conformation. Conformation of the protein meaning is the protein globular that means a circular structure like whey protein. It's a globular protein with hydrophobic residues are inside of the protein, hiding from water. Or is the conformation fibular protein, like myosin, actin and myosin, and the meat protein. It's a fibrous protein, mostly to give structure. Or the conformation is an open structure, like I said, in casein. It doesn't have a globular protein. It's not a fibular protein. It's an open structure protein that exposes both hydrophilic and hydrophobic residue, makes it a perfect emulsifier. Molecular interactions, which is really dependent on the amino acid composition and location and sequence. So, are we doing, are we having a lot of disulfide linkages within the protein itself? Or we can have disulfide linkages across different protein molecules? Are we forming quaternary structures like the casein micelle is a quaternary structure? Soy protein is a quaternary structure, whereas whey protein is not a quaternary structure. It exists as a singular protein. So some proteins form singular proteins, other forms quaternary structure of a protein. And that impacts functionality as well. So we're going to talk about all of these intrinsic factors. And then extrinsic factors that impact protein structure. So when we say extrinsic factors, that means we mean environmental. So what's the environment that the protein is in? The pH, the temperature, the ionic strength. What processing are we subjecting that protein to? Are we drying a certain uh, mixture? Are we heating to pasteurize? Are we extruding? We are subjecting to pressure and temperature and other components. So by doing so, drying, eating, extrusion, we're changing the structure of the protein. Are we extracting with certain solvents? Are we subject, if we are extracting, let's say, protein from a meal that had hexane treatment to remove the oil? So that hexane treatment, depending on the time and the amount and, and the concentration, it will impact your protein structure. Or if we're doing alkaline extraction, high alkaline conditions can also impact the protein structure. So what are the conditions that we're using to extract um, oil that might impact the protein meal or the protein itself? Um, if we're using the solvent, then we need to dry it out as well. So hexane treatment, then drying to remove the hexane, that will also impact the structure of the protein. Storage, how are we storing the, whether if it's a product already, or if it is a protein powder. So what's the humidity in the room? What's the temperature of storage? What's the concentration of the protein? Are we gonna get, if it's a beverage, are we gonna get sedimentation? Um, if it's a protein bar, are we getting hardening over time? And then you have protein modification, that we can modify the protein to change its structure. We can hydrolyze, we can do chemical modification, we can do physical by pressure, for example, 
or sonication, we can do natural reactions like Maillard reaction, we can do biotechnology, genetic modification to change the protein. So we're really going from, nat from native to denatured or modified when we look into extrinsic factor. So we are changing the protein structure. By changing the protein structure, we are changing its function. So by changing protein structure, some functions could be changed, such as organoleptic. Are we changing the taste and aroma? Are we changing the color? Hydration, are we making the protein more soluble by hydrolysis or glycation, for example? Or are we making it less soluble by denaturation due to drying or heating? How are we impact the water holding? Are we forming a gel and able to hold the water? Did we denature the way protein becomes better emulsifier, for example? So surface properties are impacted by changing of the structure. The redistribution of the hydrophobicity on the surface may impact properties that are directly related to the surface properties of the protein. Structural. How are we change, Are we increasing the viscosity once we denature the protein a little bit by heat? Are we promoting thermally induced gelation? Physical treatment, such as kneading, kneading our dough, will causing viscoelasticity to occur. So basically, changing the structure will impact the protein function either positively or negatively. We can control that. Sometimes we cannot control it, we really have to dry, we really have to pasteurize, so we're impacting our protein structure, and oftentimes it might result in detrimental effect during storage mostly. So, uh, yeah, we could add bioavailability or bioactivity. I did not add it. Yes, here I only talk about the physical functionality, but definitely these may impact bioavailability and bioactivity, definitely. So, so basically the protein functionality impact the final product quality attributes. So if we want to look at protein functionality definition, it's any physiochemical property that affects or is affected by processing and will elicit an impact on the behavior of food systems as judged by the quality attributes of the final product. Okay. So this is just an example situation. We'll have more example situations later, but if you are a soft drink manufacturer and you wish to fortify your beverage with a protein, the pH of the beverage is typically 2.5 to 3, so that's an acidic beverage. Which daily protein would you recommend they work with and why? So, whey protein. I did mention that at the beginning. So, it is whey protein, but later on when we study whey protein, we know why its structure allows it to be the golden standard for such an application. We'll talk about the surface hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity. We'll talk about its denaturation status. We'll talk about its, the impact of pH on its structure and solubility so that we understand why this is the choice. So this is coming later. All right, so another one. A muffin ingredient declaration lists sodium caseinate. Why was sodium caseinate chosen? What did I tell you about the natural structure of the caseinate just now? Huh? Open structure. It's an open structure. <clears throat> With an open structure, we call it a natural emulsifier because you have both hydrophobic and hydrophilic uh, residues exposed, so it emulsifies. So in a batter, in a muffin batter, it's kind of an emulsion too because you have the fat and then you have the aqueous, the milk or whatever water. So you really want to make sure that your system is cohesive. So adding sodium caseinate adds not only cohesiveness, also viscosity. So you need viscosity to your muffin and you need the formation of that 
emulsion as well. So it is added for that purpose. Okay, so if we want to start right at the top, we're going to start with intrinsic factors. We're going to hold off on the protein source. We'll talk about sources later on, the second part of the class. But we'll talk, we'll start with intrinsic factors and then move on to extrinsic factors, then functionality, then different sources of proteins. So you'll see this, this slide as kind of our summary of what topics we're going to talk about. Okay, so we'll start with intrinsic factors. So, proteins from different sources, they are obviously differ, they differ in their amino acid composition and sequence. Not two proteins from two different sources will have similar composition. They might have very similar composition, but they might not have similar sequence. Sequence is very important to the structure of the protein and therefore the function of the protein. Sometimes we'll see proteins from the same family share some homology. So you'll hear the term homology later on. So for example, peanut and soy are legumes. I mean, soy can be a legume and an oil seed at the same time. But both have a lot of similarity in their proteins. We call it sequence homology. And that's why some people that are allergenic to peanut might also be allergenic to um, soy. Cross-reactivity due to homology. Okay, so basically what I want to say is proteins coming from similar sources and families might have some similarity. But in general, protein differ in composition and sequence. And their, their composition and their sequence dictate their structural configuration. Because structural configuration, as we learn when we talk about the primary, secondary, and tertiary structure, the interaction that causes the formation of secondary structure and causes the formation of tertiary structure is dependent on the functional groups of the amino acids. So whatever amino acids you have and where they're located in the sequence dictate whether you're going to have a random coil or beta sheet or alpha helix or a mixture and then a tertiary structure that is globular or a tertiary structure that is open structure. Casein, for example, doesn't have a disulfide linkage, very rare. You might have, I think kappa casein has one disulfide linkage. So it's an open structure. Beta-lactoglobulin, which is a whey protein, has two disulfide linkages in it is structure, so brought the, brought the protein more into a compact structure. All right, molecular interactions. Molecular interactions, that means within the protein, intra, when you're gonna hear two terms, intra and intermolecular. Intramolecular is within the protein molecule. Inter, with an ER, intermolecular, that with, with different proteins. Okay, so depending on the amino acid, the sequence, and the structure configuration, why? Because what's exposed on the surface versus what's inside will dictate what kind of molecular interactions will occur within the protein <coughs> itself and what with other proteins in the system or with other constituents in the system. Chemical biochemical properties, this is related mostly to the hydrophobicity and net charge. So hydrophobicity is really dependent on what's the percentage of hydrophobic amino acids you have in your protein and also the sequence. So do you have them distributed as like chunks? Like here, five hydrophobic in, in a sequence forming this chunk of hydrophobic residue or pouch. Uh, or do you have them distributed as one hydrophobic, two hydrophilic, one hydrophobic, two hydrophilic? You don't have really a surface. 
So hydrophobicity is important. Next charge, how many acidic and basic amino acids do you have? And at the particular pH, do you have a net positive charge or a net negative charge? Okay. So how many ionizable groups you have and how much, what is the net charge as a particular pH? The higher the net charge at a particular pH, the more soluble is the protein at that pH. And sometimes a really high charge might impair gel formation. If you really want to form a gel, you want to be away from a pH that gives you high net charge. So when we talk about gelation, we'll see that we don't necessarily need really high net charge, but we want solubility, we really want to increase the net charge. So it really depends on what's the ultimate goal here. Because they differ in, in all of these characteristics, they are differing in functional contribution. Like I said, do you want it just to be a soluble protein? Do you want it to form a gel? Do you want it to emulsify? So definitely all these characteristics impact how the protein will function. Ah, I'm sure you love PKA, don't you? Do you remember what PKA, PKA is? We will need to know this. I know you know it. We'll just have to review it. Because it really impacts, understanding PKA and then isoelectric point will also help us understand the protein charge and the impact of pH on the charge and obviously on the functionality. So what is PKA? Uh -huh. Okay. Is it the pH to where the hydrogen You are very close to an answer there. So there is an H that comes and goes. What does that mean? Huh? Ionization. Okay, you're all very close, but can you define it? I'm going to drink my water and wait. And everybody head down. <laughs> what? Undissolved? You're all very close. Okay, I'm going to remove you from your misery. PKA is the pH at which you have 50% ionization. So 50% is ionized versus 50% not ionized. Or if you want to say dissociated and non-dissociated. The H is present or the H plus is not present. Okay, so the carboxyl group is protonated, that is not the dissociated state. The carboxyl group does not have its proton, it is in the dissociated state. <coughs> the amine group has its proton, it's positively charged. Without its protons, it will be not charged. Okay, so the pKa of the carboxyl group is different than the pKa of the amine group. In, in, the, in the protein, okay? The pKa of the carboxyl group is lower, on the lower end of the pH, it's acidic. It gives its proton very easily. So you have to decrease the pH to really low in order for the carboxyl group to retain the proton. Whereas the amine group doesn't want to give you its H, it's basic, it wants to hold on to it. Unless the pH is really high, then it will go, okay, take my H. It will give you its proton. So that's why the pKa for the basic group is really high. At high pH, it will start giving you its proton. Now, the pKa of the R group, so the amino acid has two pKa's. The carboxyl group is pKa1. The amine group 
is pKa2. But sometimes it has a third one. In the R, you have an amine or a carboxyl. That's your aspartic acid and glutamic acid has an extra carboxyl group. Your lysine, histidine, and arginine has an amine group in its R. Okay. I just gave away the answer, I think. Okay, so what's the answer here? G? Think about it again. H. It's H. Because lysine, arginine, and histidine are basic. And for basic, you want the PKA is really in the basic end for it to be to lose its hydrogen and to become uh, ionizable. Okay. Not to okay. To lose its hydrogen, it will lose its charge. These three, when they lose their hydrogen, it will lose its positive charge. Because the amine group is NH3 plus. When it gives you a proton, it will be NH2. So it lost a positive charge above the pKa of that R group. Jason, do you want me to repeat that? Can you just like, draw it on the board? Do I draw it on the board? OK, well, I'll do better than that. I'll show it here. Uh, I want to look at structure with lysine. Where is the lysine? So here you have pKa1, pKa2, pKa3. All right? So here when you have, because it's acidic, it will not get protonated unless your pH is way down. So when your pH goes way down, like pH 3, then this will pick up a hydrogen. Then it will lose its negative charge. Then the amino acid will be mostly positively charged. Yeah? Will be plus. If you increase the pH and continue increasing, this is going to lose it. This is going to, if it's say pH 9, this is going to give you a proton. This is going to give you a proton. This becomes NH2, no charge. This becomes, becomes NH2, no charge. So what's the net charge? Look here, you have negative, no charge, and no charge. So the net is negative, right? Because here it lost at pH 9. It plus H plus and it plus H plus. <coughs> so this becomes NH2, this becomes NH2. So no charge. This is still carrying a charge, negative. So the whole amino acid will be negatively charged at pH 9. At pH 3, what happens at pH 3? This gains a proton, so no longer negative. And these have their pluses here. They won't lose their pluses. So it's become? Yeah. OK. All right. So another refresher from basic knowledge. Uh, we'll stop in two minutes. Um, another refresher is your amino acid structure. You all know this. So you have a carboxyl group, you have an amine group, you have an R group, and an H. The C alpha is chiral carbon. What is chiral carbon? Chiral, when you call it chiral, that means every group, every bond of the C is with a different functional group. So the C has four bonds. Each bond is a different group. That's why we call it chiral carbon. Except for one amino acid, glycine, is the smallest amino acid, 
the R group of glycine is H. So the alpha carbon is not chiral because it has two H groups. Okay, so that's the only special thing about glycine. It's the smallest amino acid, and the R is just H. It has the most flexibility, and we'll talk about that later. So at the neutral pH, or close to neutral, your main carboxyl group and amine groups are charged. So at pH 7, let's say, or close to 7, this doesn't have its H, and this holds on to its H. That makes it basic and acidic. Okay? That's the definition of basic and acidic. At neutral, the acidic gives you its H, whereas the basic groups hold on to its H, or proton. So that is basic, that's acidic. Acidic is negatively charged at neutral, and basic is positively charged at neutral. Disregarding R, this gives you a zero net charge. All right. Because of that fact, you hear about proteins being buffers. Some of you know this fact, but don't know necessarily why do, we, why do they buffer. They buffer because of their ability to take proton and to give a proton. So when you're titrating in the presence of protein, you're titrating with an acid. That means your carboxyl groups are going to start picking up some protons and resist pH change. If you're titrating with a base, then your amine group will start giving protons, resisting pH change. Because a proton, an OH minus, gives you water, H2O. And then acid proton, when it's picked up by the carboxyl group, then there is no change in pH. Because pH is the measure of the concentration of protons in your solution. Okay? So that's why proteins are buffers. That's why try to change the pH of a beverage in the presence of protein, it takes a lot of acid. And that's why some protein beverages are sour. They are acidic, sour, astringent. Because the more you add protein in your beverage, to get it to a pH 3, you need to add more acid, more acid, more acid to reach to that pH 3. And then it becomes really sour. And that's one of the problems in industry is sourness in the protein. How can we modify the protein to make it less of a buffer? There are ways to do that. Is this really just for safety, or does it have another purpose? <coughs> oh, yes, good question. Why you tell me from processing? Which beverage requires higher thermal treatment, an acidic beverage or a neutral beverage? Neutral. A neutral, because pasteurization for acidic beverages has less conditions because you have less survival rate for bacteria. The, the bacteria that survives at neutral or higher require more. The pathogens require higher temperature to get rid of them versus acidic conditions and the bacteria that grows in acidic conditions. So yeah? just for safety? Well, for safety, so basically not just for safety because when you pasteurize a beverage at really high temperature and conditions, you change the flavor and color. Mm -hmm. So you really want the mildest conditions that you can to, um, to not impact the flavor and the, the color. So clear beverages, you prefer them to be acidic so that you don't have to treat them at high temperature uh, and adverse treatment to maintain their color and flavor. Doesn't that also make the shelf stable? Yeah, because pasteurization is basically shelf stable. Well, Pasteurization is basically stable under refrigerated conditions. Sterilization is on room temperature shelf, shelf life. Depends what you want to do with that beverage. Do you want it to be stable on room temperature or you want it to be stable in the fridge for a shorter period of time? Okay, I'll stop. Good. We'll continue next week.
Uh, where do I stop? <coughs> What happened? I didn't mean to draw. You said, you know this program? Come over. I, yeah. I just want to stop recording. Uh, oh, did I stop recording? Down here. Ah, oh. that's so.